So I, I, I remind you that last time we talked about, so basically until now we talked about uh, different training regimes, right? So we, we still have the same uh, the same uh, box with toys, right? We have parametric models that we call neural networks. We, we've seen different uh, possibilities to uh, to build these toys. We've seen uh, uh, recurrent networks. We have seen different variants of feedforward networks. So uh, from some level of abstraction, I'm thinking of them as just families of parametric functions, right? And w w one of one of the important discussions that we had until now are the different training regimes, how we can train uh, these uh, parametric models, right? So one of the most straightforward and uh, one of the frequently used ways or settings was to train them in the supervised regime for classification and regression uh, 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 purposes. Then we have seen the unsupervised regime in which we wanted to uh, discover how the data are laid uh, uh, laid out in the in the embedding space, right? And then we wanted also to generate new instances, so we build generative models, right? And this is how we, uh, we, we this is how we discussed autoencoders and uh, and variational autoencoders and GANs. And then I showed you some kind of a hybrid regime that can be called semi semi supervised and a variant or a superset of this setting, which we called uh, domain adaptation. So today I want to switch to a completely different setting, completely different uh, way of doing learning. And I would like to talk about settings in which we have some autonomous agent. So imagine we you have some agent that uh, acts in an environment, right? So this is, a, this is our environment. We can uh, apply one of a set of possible actions on that uh, environment. So suppose you have some handles with which you control the environment. And as a result, we are getting some reward signal. Okay? And we'll make some assumptions about the observability of, of this environment. So basically, I would like to train, uh, to train this, uh, this uh, artificial intelligent uh, agent. And probably, if there is... Uh, a setting to which the term AI applies the best, this is the setting. We have some, some intelligent, intelligent system that acts in a world and tries to uh, infer how the world works and how to play this game in, uh, in the interaction with the environment in the best possible way. So I would like to formalize this setting and we'll see uh, practically three variants of how to do learning in, in this setting. And basically, all these techniques, despite their apparent simplicity, they appear to be very powerful. For example, the, the actor critic setting that I will show you uh, in the last part of, of, this, uh, of, of today's lesson will be the one that actually is used in the best, uh, the, the best existing AI systems today, like, for example, uh, DeepMind's uh, AlphaZero that wins uh, uh, chess grandmasters and go grandmasters and basically plays better than humans. And you will see some more hands-on and practical um, aspects of reinforcement learning in, in the tutorial as well. Okay, so I would like to formalize first the process of making decisions. Okay, so basically uh, this setting is all about making decisions. Playing a game is about making decisions, right? So basically, Let's put some some formalism behind this. So I will assume that I will have some some time some timed process. So I will have some time variable, and I will assume that my time is discrete, and arbitrarily it will increment in units of one. Okay, so I will will denote it by t. Okay, so the typical the typical setting the way it works. I will I will assume that the agent observes a state that I will denote by ST, I will be using color codes as always, so state will be blue. So observe as a state S, ST at time T, one of the possible states in which the world can can exist, okay? So here an implicit or actually an implicit, explicit assumption that the state of the world is fully observable, which is a kind of simplification. For example, if I'm driving an autonomous vehicle, I don't really see what is going to pop uh, uh, to pop up uh, behind that curve that I'm going to uh, that I'm going to take on my right? 
so I don't really have full observability of the of the environment. But let's assume for our simplistic assumption that we have full observability, there is an equivalent more general formalism of uh, partially observable decision processes. Okay, we are not going to talk about them. The agent observes the state of the world, then the agent performs an action, action will be read, AT, out of a possible set of actions. So I will be assuming that both actions are and state are discrete. The state space might be huge, like just imagine how many states you might have on a chessboard, right? So it's, it's, a, it's zillions of different possible configurations of, of, of pieces on the chessboard, but still it's, it's a finite discrete set. Okay, and then also the the number of actions. For example, if I'm playing Pac-Man, then I have four different actions that I can I can uh, um, I can perform at every at every time step. Right? I can go left, right, up, and down. Maybe Pac-Man shoots also. Right? So maybe also to shoot. Right? So five possible actions. Doesn't shoot. Okay. So then then only four. So then, so I so I observed my state. Based on that state, I performed some action, and in response to that action, the environment transitions to a new state. Okay, so I'm thinking of the environment as some kind of a finite state machine. Okay, so the environment now changed somehow, and this change is reflected by the transitioning to the new state S T plus one, which of course can be remaining in the same state. And, as and I will assume that this transition from state st to st plus 1 happens stochastically, so it doesn't need to be something deterministic. It, could be a, it can be a stochastic state machine. And essentially the probability of having state st plus 1 given previous state st and action at and basically all the history of the previous states and previous actions is what is going to govern my um, my transition probability. Okay, so this is uh, this is how I decide the probability law that governs my transition. The transition might still be stochastic, right? And basically, having this ugly conditioning on all the previous history basically makes the thing intractable. So I'm going to assume a very a very handy Ma uh, Markovian property, assuming that I only depend on the immediate past. So basically, all this tail is not needed. Okay, so this is called Markovian property, meaning that the next state is only a function of the previous state and the previous action. Okay, and I will further assume what in in Markov chains is called homogeneity, or we can call it time invariance. So uh, that this probability law. This condition, conditional probability, the transition probability, is uh, invariant to translation in time. So basically, transitioning from state s prime, f from state s to s prime at time t, is the same probability uh, under action A is the same probability as transitioning from uh, state s to s prime under the same action A at some other time. Okay, so this conditional probability of the transition doesn't change in time. Okay. So it's, it's an assumption, it might be valid in some cases, might be invalid in, in other cases, but this is the assumption I'm going to make. Okay. Now, pay attention, this doesn't mean that the process is stationary. Stationarity means that the joint distribution of the, of the states or the actions is, uh, is, uh, is a shift invariant uh, function, but, but it is not, typically. Okay, you need some additional conditions for stationarity to happen. But the transition probability is uh, is translation invariant. In, in Markov chain, this is called homogeneity. So the, the, the chain is, is homogeneous. Okay. Now, again, so we have we observed the state ST, we performed action AT. As a result, the environment transitioned to a new state ST plus one. And I assume that there is some reward that I will call RT plus one, that we received as the result of this transaction, that is going to be a function of the current, or the, basically the previous state from which we transitioned to a new, a new state, and the, the action that we performed, ST and AT, that this is basically, this is going to be our deterministic reward. Okay? And of course, I assume that I can observe it, so I can measure this reward. I receive it, receive it immediately after I do this transaction. 
Okay. So basically, this is our model of the of the interaction. Let's see what we can t tell about the reward. Yes, a question. Okay, so the state space, we can assume that both the state space and the action space are known to the agent, which uh, a, more, a way more problematic assumption, which we will not assume, is that the transition probability is known. Ahead. So assume that I have a zillion of states, a very big state space, so let's just number them arbitrarily from one to some very big n. I know all of them, but I have no clue how this function looks like. Right? And I have no clue how this function looks like. So neither neither this nor that, right? So I, I I cannot assume that I know them. So basically if I knew them, so I knew all the rules of the game, uh, I would be in the setting which typically is called optimal control. So I know my system and I want to control it optimally. The reinforcement learning setting combines uh, optimal control with system identification. So I don't know the rule of the game, I want to discover the rules. And I also want to play it optimally. Okay, so this is the slight difference between between the two settings. Okay. So regarding the reward, so suppose that after every transaction, such transaction is called an experience. We'll we'll give it a formal name. So after every such time step, every such experience, I I receive some reward, which can be negative if my my step resulted in some damage. What I really care about is some cumulative reward, which is typically called total reward or return, we'll call it return, uh, that I receive summing over all time steps. Okay, So I will call this g. g at time t is the reward that I'm going to receive from time t to the future. Okay. So this is, of course, this is a meaningful quantity that I would somehow like to maximize, right? I would like to maximize the total reward. Unfortunately, typically these quantities will be will be positive, right? But maybe negative. But suppose I'm playing well, so these quantities are positive. So when I sum them over an infinite number of time time steps, I'm going to get an infinite quantity here as well. Okay? So this is this is a problem. I cannot really optimize GT if one uh, if, if one behavior gives me an infinite number and another behavior also gives me an infinite number. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to fix some finite horizon. So the sum will not go to infinity, it will go to some finite number of steps in the future. Okay, so then this is obviously a finite quantity and I can prefer one behavior of the agent versus another behavior of the agent by, by looking at this quantity and deciding whether I'm maximizing it or not. Okay, so this is one version. Another version is to build some kind of a soft version of a finite horizon. So I still want to sum my rewards to infinity, but somehow to discount them in such a way that something that is far in the future is uh, is less uh, important than something that is immediately in my future. So call this some kind of a memento mori, right? So I I really care about what happens tomorrow and not something that happens in 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 two years from now. Okay, so this is how we are going to, to do it. I'm, I'm going to introduce gamma, a parameter from zero to one. Okay, and I'm going to discount each future step by an exponentially decaying, basically a geometric, a geometric uh, 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 series of gamma k, the powers of gamma, that will that will make my future returns diminish as I adventure into the future. Okay, so uh, we are going to adapt this cumulative discounted reward as our as our objective. Okay, so we are going to try to maximize this kind of a reward. Okay, so essentially we have a, a tuple with five parameters, right? We have the state space. This is the space in uh, containing all the states in which our world, in, in which our environment can be found at every time step. We have the action space. This is the, uh, the set of actions we can perform. Okay. We have the transition probability, the probability of transitioning from state to the next state under some action from the action space. We have the reward function, the instantaneous reward function, and we have the discount parameter with which we, we, uh, we can uh, calculate the return on future steps with some discount factor. Okay, 
Now, I will also assume typically this is the case, right? So every game ends at some point, right? So there will be some set of terminal states. So, for example, in chess, the terminals, there are three, three types of terminal states. Of course, there are many, many s states on the chessboard that can be that can be characterized as terminal. The white wins, the, the black wins, or we have a draw, right? So there are zillions of different configurations of the pieces on the board that can belong to either of these three categories. And of course, there is a much bigger category that is neither one of these three uh, of the, these three possibilities, right? So I will distinguish between terminal states and non-terminal states. And each game can be characterized as a sequence. We'll call it basically the game from its beginning at state S0 until the final terminal state. So this is the terminal state, the game is over here, okay? So I will call it an episode, since I'm assuming that both the, uh, both the game itself and potentially also the behavior of the agent can be stochastic, the same, the very same Markov decision process that is given by these, by these five components uh, can actually result in different episodes, in different sequences of states and actions that we are observing, even though we are playing exactly by the same rules, right? Because there is some amount of randomness that is inherent in, into this model. And I will call such one sequence of state, action, next state, and the resulting reward as an experience. Okay, so our life, our life in this game is a sequence of such experiences. Okay, like real life. Okay, so this is our, our experience. Okay, so let's now talk, so we define the rules of the game. So let's now define the rules by which the agent behaves. So we want to define the agent behavior. And formally this is called a policy. Okay, so the agent behaves according to some policy. So in, in, in our terminology, the policy will be just a conditional distribution of an action given the state. Okay, so it tells me the probability of performing a certain action being in a certain state S. Okay? So essentially this fully determines the agent behavior and please pay attention that the agent behavior can be stochastic. It's a, it's a distribution, right? So there, uh, there will be some actions that, uh, that are more probable in the specific state according to what we decided is good or bad for playing this game. But being in the same state we might uh, take different actions in different realizations of, of the game. Okay? Of course, the particular case would be a deterministic policy. So in, in the case of a deterministic policy, this will be just a singleton distribution. There will be some action happening with probability 1 and the rest of the actions will happen with probability 0. This is a particular case. Another assumption that I'm going to make is that this policy is time invariant. Okay? So it doesn't matter whether I'm at state S at some time T, or I'm at state S at some time T prime, the conditional distribution will be the same. So it doesn't depend on the time. Okay? Any questions? Okay, so let's let's introduce two quantities that I will call, call, uh, call them as a value functions. They, they are usually known as value functions. I would like to, I would like to tell how, uh, how good, basically, how much reward, how much return, basically, this discounted uh, accumulated reward I'm going to receive being in a certain state or being in a certain state and performing a certain action. Okay? So let's suppose that the agent starts in some state st at time t, okay, and then it follows the policy pi, that conditional distribution that we defined before, okay. So we we start with with the state st, we draw a, an action at from the policy from the conditional distribution, okay. So we get some action. Let's say if it is a deterministic policy, then it will be always the same action, and as the result, we receive a reward. Okay, so we we acted according to this action, we received the reward. I always attribute the reward to the following time step. This is just, just a convention. This is how it is typically defined in, in the literature. And then I transition to a next state. 
of course, I transition to the next state according to this transition probability, right? So this is the conditional probability of what is denoted here is the probability of drawing a new state given the previous state and the action, okay? So I draw the new state from this probability, then I perform a new action from the policy now given the new state I am in, and I receive a new reward. And the game continues this way, okay? Now, what is my expected return? So if I assume that I started my game at the, the time doesn't matter, right? Because everything we defined here, both the transition probability and the policy, both conditional distributions are time invariant, right? So I'm writing as t, I could write as zero, it doesn't matter. I will actually write as zero. Uh, so I, I know that I start from state s and I know that I follow the policy. So both are given, okay? And my question is, what is going to be my expected return? The return is basically is the discounted sum of all future rewards that I'm going to receive. Okay? Well, obviously this is going this is my definition of return, right? So I, I as I as I promised, I am writing as zero because I don't care about the starting time. So this is this is the expectation I need to compute. And this expectation will be a function of S, right? Of course a function of policy as well. But if I fix policy, I will receive for every state some expectation of the future re return. Some states will be horrible. Horrible. If, for example, I am left with just my white king against uh, against a full army of uh, of black pieces, well, I guess there is not so much to expect, right? And on the other hand, if, for example, I have the queen and the other uh, the other uh, the, my adversary doesn't have the queen and uh, has less pieces or a, a, a worse position in chess, then I, I probably should expect a higher return. Right, so this is going to be a function that depends on the policy. I will think of the policy as a parameter, and it's a function of the state. Okay, so I will call it v pi s, and this function is called a state value function. So it gives the value in terms of the expected uh, return for every state under a given policy. Okay, makes sense. Now, in the same way, we can define a variant of a value function which is called the action value function. Okay, so again, uh, so we are starting at some arbitrary time t with the state s, then we perform an action a. So before we just allowed the policy to select the action for, now, for us, now we select a specific action. It might be very improbable under the given policy, it doesn't matter. And then we follow the policy pi. So again, here we started as before from state S. Now we performed a specific action that is given. We received the reward, transitioned to a new state, now performed an action from the policy. And from this point on, we follow the policy. Okay? So the expected return now will be given by this conditional expectation. We have the action added to the conditioning variables. Okay? Because the action is given now. The, the action at T the first action that we performed in the, in the initial state. And again, it will be given by, by the expectation of this, uh, this infinite series. And I will call this an action value function. So it, probably the, a better term, a term would be state action value function. Because I will, will be denoting it by Q. This is how it is denoted in the, in the literature. Again, the policy is a parameter. But now I have two arguments, the state and the action. So it tells me what is going to be my expected return if I'm performing action A being in state S, okay? So again, for example, if I, uh, if my, my, my I will, let's say I'm in a very good state and my VS would give me a, an excellent return, but now I make a move that sacrifices my queen, that probably will, is going to be, give me a much worse return that the average or the expectation would otherwise give me, right? This is the difference between, between the two value functions, okay? So suppose I'm now, I'm trying to, to give you a pictorial, pictorial description. So suppose I'm now at state S, okay? And the state value function essentially tells me to average all these possible trajectories, right? Over all possible actions that I can, I can take from this state and basically to the future, 
Okay, but what is this expectation exactly? I can, I can. This is typically called the, the total expectation theorem or the smoothing theorem, depending on, on on the on the context. I can add conditioning on A here and take another expectation over A. A, of course, coming from pi, right? So if I do this, I can write this explicitly as the sum over A. The sum, basically, to get the expectation, I need to to write the probability mass here, pi A given S of the of the value of this conditional expectation. This conditional expectation we called it Q pi S A. Okay? So essentially if I take a specific action here, the the expected return I'm going to get by taking action A from state S is given by Q. Q pi S A. Right? And now I'm going to average over these quantities, weighting every possible action that I can take by the probability of that action. Okay, and the probability is given by pi a given s by my policy. Okay, so basically this relation connects between v and q, between the state value function and the uh, the action value function. Okay, so let's see what happens under the expectation. My let's start with the with the with the state value function, so the state value function is given by this expectation given obviously the policy and the initial state. So I'm going to transition from state S0 to state S1. I'm going to receive this reward R1, okay? And then in the future, the reward I'm going to receive will be the expected reward is given by V pi S1. This is the expected return I'm going to get from the state S1, but I'm going to discount it by the factor of gamma, right? Because it happens one step into the future. Every step into the future gets a discount of gamma. Okay? So first of all, I will remove my dependence on this t. t doesn't matter, so I will start at t equals zero. Okay? And let me write g0 as r1 plus gamma r2 plus gamma squared r3 and so on to infinity. Okay, and let me take this gamma outside of the parentheses. So I have R1 plus gamma, R2 plus gamma R3, and so on, right? So I can write this as gamma Vs1, okay? And of course I can take this gamma, this Vs1 uh, from the expectation because Vs1 is not a random quantity. It's, it's, it's already the expectation, the conditional expectation of, of G. Okay? So let me write it this way explicitly. The expectation, the expectation that is written here is going to, basically I'm going to, to do average weighted average over all possible actions that I can take from state S. So these, this is A from the action space. The probability of taking this action from state S is given by the policy, pi A given S, right? And what I'm going to, what I'm going to receive is, for, first I'm going to get an instantaneous reward. And the instantaneous reward from state S under action A is given deterministically by the function RSA, right? So this is the reward, this is basically this reward that I'm going to receive, right? By taking this action. So I'm going to receive this reward, and then I'm going to transition into a new state. So you see it is drawn here. I perform one of the possible actions. This is the probability for me to, ch to choose one of these actions. So suppose I chose an action A, this is the instantaneous reward I'm going to receive, and now, I, now the environment will respond to this action by transitioning to a new state. Transitioning to a new state happens with this probability, so I will transition to a state S prime with the probability that is written here. It will depend on my current state S and the action that I took, A. Okay? And what will be the expected return that I will receive from, from that new state S prime? It will be exactly V pi S prime. Okay. So I can write it uh, this way. I just split it into in, into two sums. So I have the first term 
telling me what is going to be my instantaneous reward by performing action A, and this is the discounted return that I'm going to see in the future. Okay? So let me write it like this and just see what is going on here. This depends on one argument S. So if S is a finite collection of stakes, essentially I have a vector, a very big vector, V, that tells me the value function for every state. Okay? Now what goes on here, we have a matrix essentially, R, with the first index S and the second index A, that I'm multiplying by this transition probability, which it can also be thought of as a matrix, right? And then I have some other matrix vector calculations in the second part as well. So I will call this a vector R pi, a vector in a, in a high dimensional space according to the number of states I have in my state space. I will call this R pi. This is my instantaneous reward that I'm going to get in state S. This is the expected instantaneous reward. I will call this P pi, this basically term in the parentheses. It's a matrix. And this is going to be V pi. Okay, so this is a matrix, let's call it S times S, right? So it has two, uh, two variables, S prime and S. Okay, two indices, two independent indices. And this is again, V pi. So I can write this as a matrix vector equation, V pi equals R pi plus gamma times R pi V pi. And I can solve it for V pi, okay? So essentially, if I know the rules of the game, if I know the P and I know the pi, I know the policy, I can actually calculate the value function, okay? I'm not saying that this is practical, this matrix might be huge to invert, but at least it is possible in theory. Okay, any questions? So let's do the same, let's do the same for the uh, action value function. So with the action value function, the situation is very similar, but now we are also specifying our first action. So we are starting at state S0. We are performing an action, why did I write A1? Of course, A0. Okay, we receive the instantaneous reward R1. This is deterministic, right? Because there is no, no uh, a randomness in the choice of the action and our reward was assumed to be deterministic and now the environment will transition to state s1 which of course happens according to the transition probability and what we what are we going to receive in the future well in the future we are going to receive uh, the discounted return of transitioning from state s1 under action a1 and this is given by q pi okay so i can write it again like this just pay attention that I'm adding the current action into the conditioning of the expectation. Again, I write it like this, and I can split it into two terms. The instantaneous reward R1, which is now deterministic, plus discounted action value function S1, A1. Okay? So again, you can see this... Uh, in the diagram, I perform action A, a deterministic action A, because this is one of my arguments. So I, I know which action I'm performing, so I, I will immediately know what is going to be my instantaneous reward. It is simply given by RSA. I know what I'm going to receive after making the first, the first experience in this game. And then the future will be discounted by this factor gamma. The system will, the environment will transition to a new state according to this, probab this conditional probability, the transitional probability, right? And the future value of the state S prime, basically what is written here, is V pi S prime. And we have seen that V pi S prime can be given by, by this weighted average of Q pi S prime A prime. So I'm weighting it by the probability of each A prime happening summing over every A prime. Okay? So l let's let's view it in a slightly more 
general way. So we have two ways of giving uh, giving the expected reward, assigning the expected reward to a sequence of actions. So let's just play this game again. I'm starting at some state s, and then I'm fo following the policy. This is how we treated the state value function, right? So I'm going to perform this trajectory. I will start with the state s, then I will perform some random, potentially random, uh, action a0 from my policy, and I will receive the reward r1. This will bring me to the state s1, in which I'm going to play another action a1 from the policy, and this will give me the reward r2, and again will transition me to a state s2, and so on. Okay, so I have a trajectory that I will be denoting by tau. This is the trajectory until I hit some terminal state and I'm done. Okay? Or, theoretically, if I have no terminal states, I can go like this ad infinitum. This can be an infinite trajectory. Another possibility is that I start at state S, then I perform a known action A that I decided, not according to the policy, and then I play following the policy. So it's, it, it is again going to be the trajectory, but now the only difference that the first action in this trajectory is given as A. Okay, but I still have a trajectory tau, and I would like to assign this trajectory the expected return. Or a specific trajectory will obviously have this return, and I might be interested in the expectation of this return over all possible trajectories. In the left-hand case, trajectories that start from the state S, and the expectation over such trajectories will be called the state value function. And in the, in the case on the right, it will be expectation over all trajectories that start with state S and action A. And the resulting quantity will be called the uh, action value function, Q. Okay? So now, now that we can assign a numerical quantity, some kind of some kind of goodness of uh, of a certain state or of a certain action taken in in a given state. So far, we have assumed that the policy is something given; it's just a parameter a parameter that we fix. But the really interesting problem, the really in important question, is how to select the optimal policy. Okay, so essentially, we would like to select those high return trajectories and make them more probable. So there will be some trajectories that receive really high reward, that have that result in very high return. And I would like to select such a policy out of all, all possible policies that I can play that will make these trajectories more probable than other low return trajectories, right? So in this way, I will be, uh, on the average, I'm going to, uh, to play better. I have a criterion that tell me, tells me that I, I, how well I play, and I would like to maximize this criterion, right? So essentially, we want to find uh, the policy pi that maximizes the value function, because the value function tells us uh, the expected return that I'm going to receive. Okay. So usually, when you see some, you, you see the the combination of terms optimal control, you usually uh, find Bellman's name and related concepts like dynamic programming. So let's see it in this context as well. So I would like to define an operator on state value functions. And I will show you a very similar construction for, um, for action value functions. It will be exactly the same with some nuances. So the input to this operator is a function that assigns a number to every state in the, uh, in the space of states. Okay? And the, the, the output of this operator will be obviously a new state function. It works from the space of state functions to the space of state functions. So I will denote this operator by t. So again, this let's call this function, let's call it v or v or u prime. It's a new state function, so it's a function of s. And I'm going to define it this way. It will be the maximum, of course, the maximum is over both terms, right? It's, it will be the maximum over a in the action space of rs plus a plus the discounted future. So transition to, a, to, a, to every possible state s prime, 
according to my transition probability, times the value of those states s prime. Okay, so I take my arbitrary state value function doesn't need to come from any policy, it can be just an arbitrary function. I crunch it in this way and I spit out a new value function. Okay? So this is, my, this is I'm calling this the Bellman operator. Now, another thing that I'm going to construct, you give me any value function u, just any value function u, I don't care, I just need to give, uh, to give me uh, non-negative values to to, to every state, and I will construct you the following deterministic policy. So this policy will look for the uh, for an action that maximizes this argument, and if few ac a few actions maximize this, I will just pick uh, pick uh, an arbitrary one, and this will happen with probability one, and all the rest of the actions will happen with probability zero. So I will always select the action that maximizes this expression. Okay. Now, what is the relation between this and this? So I, will, I will denote this, so I, I admit this is a cumbersome not notation, I will call this policy that I construct from a function u as pi star u. Star because I'm, I'm doing some optimization, so usually the product of optimization is denoted with a star. So it's sort of an optimal policy given, given u. Okay? Now, what is the relation between this tu, the application of the Bellman operator to a state value function u, and this construction of the policy. Now, we know that a policy can be, to a policy we, we can assign a value function, right? We call it v pi, right? So let's compute the value function of this policy. The, I will denote it by v pi star u, okay? So what is going to be the value of this policy, the value of the state S according to this policy. Well, what you see here in the expression that we are maximizing is exactly the expected return, right? And we are maximizing it. What is going to be the value? The value is going to be the max, right? But this is exactly what the Bellman operator gives us, right? So basically, the value function of this deterministic policy will be exactly t applied to u. Can you see it? So this policy and the Bellman operator are related in this way. So if I apply, you give me any value function and I apply to it the Bellman operator, it will give me, uh, it will be correspond to the value function that I am going to obtain under this deterministic policy. Okay? Now, let's, let's say we are given some policy pi, and this is the associated state value function, okay? So now I'm starting from the policy, not from the value function, but from the policy. You give me some policy pi, it can be, can be really horrible policy, but it is a policy, and I compute the value function. This is how the value function is defined, right? Now I'm going to replace this policy by a new policy that I will call pi prime. The way I'm going to construct pi prime is I'm going to apply that rule that I showed you before that I called pi star applied to the value function v pi. So again there are many v's and pi's and u's so just follow this. I will then uh, in the next slide I will go show you a picture. So I start with a policy from that policy I derive a value function v. Okay? I use that value function to define a new policy according to the rule that that I wrote here. This is the rule. Okay, pi star. You give me the value function and I give you the new policy. So this is my new policy pi prime. Okay? What is going to be the associated value function? We we have seen this already. This will be the action of the Bellman operator to v pi. Okay? And here it is explicitly Okay, now let's go back to the first expression. Allow me to write it slightly differently. You have pi here and you have pi here, right? Let's take it outside the parentheses. Okay? Now, pi is a probability distribution, right? So it sums to one. So in the first expression, we have sum over all pi's of some 
something in the parentheses, and in the second expression we have this the very same thing in the parentheses, but now we take maximum over a. So here we we take a convex combination of of this something written in the parentheses, and here we maximize. Okay, what what is bigger? Obviously, the second thing is non inferior to the first thing, so we can write this inequality, right? So essentially, what we what we did, we improved the policy, or maybe improved sounds like like a sharp inequality. We found a policy that is non inferior in the sense of the value function than the previous previous policy that we started with. So I will write this as this inequality. So I will write this inequality between the policies, meaning that there is. A, a related inequality between uh, between the value functions. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So on so on one hand we have we have this right. So we have v pi, so or we have t v pi lower bounded by v pi. So by applying the Bellman operator to v pi, we can only improve the value function, right? But can we improve it to infinity? Can it just grow infinitely? So we have a lower bound. Do we have an upper bound? We have an upper bound, right? So remember that a value function under a policy is the expectation of the discounted reward, right? The cumulative re uh, discounted reward, our return. And we constructed it in such a way that it will always be a finite quantity. So it is upper bounded by the maximum value of our instantaneous reward. It's a function RSA. It has a maximal value times the sum of this geometric series, which, which is just 1 over 1 minus gamma. Right? It's a finite number. It's a finite number. So this TV and TV pi, sorry, is lower bounded by V pi, but it is also upper bounded by some constant. Okay? So Suppose we now do the following. We we start with the policy pi zero and the associated value function v pi zero. We apply the Bellman operator to this value function and we get v pi one. This is our new value function, which we can consider it by basically applying this rule pi star to the value function and generating a new policy pi one. Okay? And what is the relation between pi zero and pi one? We improved over pi zero, right? Or at least not, not didn't deteriorate pi zero. Okay, so we have this sequence of improving policies. Okay, and this, after applying a sufficiently big number, n number of iterations, we have this policy, this value function here that that improved over v pi zero because it is also upper bounded. It will converge to to this limit point v star. Of course, the policy is not guaranteed to converge to any point. It doesn't need to be unique, but the value will converge. And one of the policies that we select, the, the deterministic policy, uh, will be non-inferior. So basically, you cannot do a better policy than... There might be other policies that, uh, that achieve the same value, but there is no policy that achieves a better value. Okay. So basically, you have this convergence sequence. Uh, t to the power n, n applications of the Bellman operator to some initial, to some initial uh, value function converges to v star, and if we take two consecutive iterations somewhere in the tail of this of this sequence, you can see that basically very easily that we have a fixed point. So this v star is a fixed point of the Bellman operator. So if we start with v star, we are not going to change it. Okay. I'm I'm a little bit sloppy on details, but hopefully you get uh, you get the idea. So basically, we have this fixed point. So essentially, the optimal state value function v star satisfies this fixed point equation, right? So basically, v star the optimal the optimal value function has to be the fixed point of the Bellman operator. Let's write it explicitly. This is how it looks like, and this equation is called the Bellman equation. Okay. Now the optimal, or I'm saying the optimal, an optimal policy doesn't need to be unique. No uniqueness is guaranteed here. One of the possible optimal policies is exactly this uh, policy pi star associated 
to V star. Okay, so if we have the value function that satisfies Be Bellman's equation, then we can derive a deterministic policy from it. There might be some other policies that also give the same value, but there is no policy that gives a better value. Okay? Now we can do exactly the same for the action value function. Just saying. So, so basically, uh, we can do the same for the for the action value function. So, for the action value function, the Bellman equation will look like this, slightly simpler. That's why we are going to actually work with the action value function, not the state value function. And the corresponding, again, non-unique optimal policy will be given by this deterministic policy, simply selecting the action that maximizes Q star S A. So you have different possible re expected returns from state A under every possible action A, so just select the action that maximizes this return, right? So this is a very meaningful optimal policy. Okay? Now, of course, the relation between V star and Q star is that V star is the maximum over A of Q star. Not surprising, right? Okay, so so we have seen basically the equivalent uh, the equivalent Bellman equation for the uh, for the Q function for the uh, action state function, right? So how do we find? Uh, so l let's first interpret the, the 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 Bellman equation. Sometimes it is also known as the Bellman optimality principle. So essentially, the, let's do let's do it for the for the Q function. So what we ha what we have we start at some state S. We perform some given action A, and as the result, we are given this reward R S A. Okay, and then from this from this point, the environment can transition into one of the possible states. Let's say it transitions to a state S prime, and this happens with this probability. Okay. And then, at this point, we are going to perform an action that will give us a certain expected reward. Now, my question is, what is, go what is going to be the best action we can perform at this stage? So I want a best policy. So what action I'm going to, to, to perform here? Obviously, I'm going to maximize over the choice of the actions here. Maximize this um, this action value function, right? So this action value function tells me what what re what return I'm going to expect if I perform this action a prime, being at state s prime. Obviously, I want to get maximum reward, so I'm I'm going to select the maximum over all possible actions a prime, right? So basically, the the Bellman principle tells us essentially that it doesn't matter at which state s and a we start, we want our decision to be optimal for the following states as well, okay? That's why I have a maximum there, okay? Now, how are we going to, uh, how are we going to uh, actually find this optimal uh, value function? And we have seen basically that it, it has to be a fixed point of the Bellman iteration if we work with the, with the state value function, we can do the same for the action value function. So I will define the Bellman operator, I will denote it by Q instead of T, that accepts a, an action value function and produces some new action value function according to the rule that, that is written here. And the associated deterministic policy we have seen, uh, we have seen it already, right? It will be just, it will be just, uh, uh, it will be just this term, right? The, the action that gives us the maximum of Q with probability one. And we're going to, to do the following. We are going to start with some arbitrary uh, action value function Q zero. And then we are going to just apply the Bellman operation to our previous iterate and in this way produce the next iterate. Okay, so we're going to do what is called fixed point iteration. Sometimes uh, it is called backward induction, and most typically it is called dynamic programming. Okay, so basically this fixed point iteration is called dynamic programming. And you, you certainly have encountered it, for example, in the context of finding shortest paths in graphs. This is, this is a more general setting, but it is still exactly the same idea. 
So basically, we are doing a fixed point iteration of the Bellman operator, and after a sufficient number of iterations, we are going to converge to the um, to the optimal action value function. Okay. So this is our value iteration. What is the, what is the problem with this? So basically, it looks like we are done, right? Well, first of all, we don't know p, but suppose we are we are talking about a setting where we do know p. So we identified our system. We know the rules of the game. For example, if I'm playing chess, I know the rules of the game, so I can I can tell you p. The difficulty is that s can be a very high dimension, and a can be a very high dimension. And you can just not uh, tractable to compute it. So it is completely intractable for any reasonable practical situation. Basically, the Chess is is a, is is a chess is a is a morbid example, but even much much simpler games they have a huge state space, really huge. So even computing one iteration, even storing this this table of s by a is completely infeasible. Okay. So what we can do, we can do we can do an approximate solution. We'll need to look for approximate solution. And people in optimal control have been working with approximate solutions of, of, of these dynamic problems. Uh, probably works by by Bertsekas from the 80s, more or less. They 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 uh, more or less put uh, f uh, put forth this uh, uh, this direction in optimal control. Uh, and in optimal control, the typical assumption that we know the dynamics of, of the MDP, we know P and R. We know the transition probability and, and we know the instantaneous reward. So it's like knowing the rules of the game. And in our case that we call reinforcement learning, we don't know the environment. So we are discovering the environment together with building the optimal behavior. Okay, so it's, it's in control, this would be called uh, system identification plus approximate uh, uh, approximation of the optimal policy, right? And this is typically known as reinforcement learning. Okay, so we are in this setting. We want to do reinforcement learning. Okay, so if we don't know how to do this value iteration, how to do dynamic programming because of the of the of the uh, size challenge, let's try to do something approximate. Okay, so the approximation I'm going to do, I'm going, uh, so I really want to find this, but I cannot. So let's just approximate it by some parametric model. So and every time you hear parametric model, of course, think of a neural network. Okay, so I will build maybe some crazy, very high dimensional neural network with lots of parameters, but still it is something tractable, right? So this thing is going to receive, to, is going to receive S and will tell me the uh, it will tell me the basically the the value of every state right so if i if i assume that um, if i assume that i have a finite set of actions let's say let's call them alpha 1 to alpha m or i can just conventionally call them 1 to m so what i can actually approximate is not a function of two arguments, but a vector valued function, an m dimensional vector, that given a state will give me the value of all possible actions from that state. Okay? So this is my vector valued function. It's a vector in Rm. M is the number of actions that I can take. Okay? So for example, if Pac-Man has four different actions through, throughout the game, so my approximation of the action value function as a function of the state, will be a four-dimensional vector. So it will tell me the expected return of going left, going right, going up, going down, being at state S. Okay, so I have a map from S to R3. And S might be some very big state space, but basically neural networks are very good at solving these kind of uh, regression problems, right? So this is what we're going, this is what we're going to do. We're going to predict the return of every possible action that we are capable of taking from state s okay so how do we train this so uh, th the goal is clear right so we, we 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 cannot perform a value iteration but we can build some approximator and make it close enough to to the optimal uh, uh, action value function q, q star 
how do we train it? So we need a loss function to minimize, right? So ideally, we would like our approximate function to satisfy Bellman's equation, right? If it satisfies Bellman's equation, we, we are done, right? We know that we have an optimal solution, just in parametric form. So first of all, it, it might happen that the capacity of our model is insufficient to uh, satisfy this exactly, right? So there is, a Q, uh, there is a Q star that satisfies this equation exactly, but that function Q star doesn't belong to the space of functions that we can model with the parameters theta, okay? So, and th then of course, it might be that even if it does belong to that space, we cannot find it. So practically, we would like to allow some inexactness here. So I'm, I will define the following loss. So the loss will be, a uh, of course, a function of theta, because these are our optimization variables now, right? Like in every supervised learning setting. So I'm going to take expectation over S and A, okay? Because my function is a function of S and A, and I will compute the simple quadratic loss between my between my approximation of the value function Q at state S action A with respect to some idea I would like to put some ground truth here that I will denote by Y. So the way I'm going to write this ground truth, so first of all, if, if I'm now, let's say, at state S and uh, from state S I did some action A, I will receive a return RT plus one, okay? And then I transition to state ST plus one, so it already happened. I'm, I'm basically looking at, my, at one of my experiences. So if the environment transitioned into a terminal state, I'm done. There will be no future rewards, right? So this is my, oh, my future is this. So this will be my Y, obviously, right? Now, if S is not a terminal state, if ST plus one is not a terminal state, then this is the instantaneous reward I'm going to get, but there will be something in the future, right? And that's something in the future. Of course, I'm going to take the, my maximum, basically my action will be the one that maximizes my uh, value function. So I'm taking maximum over A from my uh, value function. Now the value function is a, is a function of theta, but I don't want Y to be a function of theta because it will could result in a completely intractable problem. So I'm writing here theta minus like we did with RNNs to emphasize that I'm treating it here as a constant. So this is my current theta. I'm going to, to do a gradient step on the loss function, but I'm not going to treat this as a variable. Okay? So I'm assuming essentially that Y is independent of theta, of my parameter. That's why it's theta minus this, this notation. Okay? Now, in practice, here I have this expectation. I cannot evaluate a real expectation. What I'm going to do, I'm going to approximate this as an ensemble average on experiences of this form, right? So I have my current state, current action, the reward I received, and the next state, okay? So basically my loss will be simply the sum on this mini batch. So I have to write it one over the number of uh, experiences that I'm summing over, so I'm, I will just drop this constant. The loss will be proportional to this sum. And then I have two, two choices. If st plus one is terminal again, this is going to be my my target, right? Rt plus one. And if it is non-terminal, I have this term added, and again, pay attention that theta minus means that I do evaluate it at current theta, but I'm not doing, I'm not computing gradients with respect to this theta. Okay, any questions? Okay, so the question was, uh, so basically it's, it was was a reasonable uh, criticism about the choice of the loss. So the choice of the loss here was, uh, was uh, basically the expected return. Uh, in, some, in some scenarios, you, you might not be satisfied with expected return. For example, think of an agent that, for example, uh, trades stock, right? So it's, it's nice that you can uh, achieve very good average return, but you can also lose. So there, maybe you want to optimize some worst case or some quantile, some sufficiently low quantile to make sure that, that the chance of losing will be very small. So of course, in different settings, you might choose different types of loss. But 
the advantage of the expectation is that it is easily tractable. Okay, and worst case is not necessarily the best the best thing to do. But worst case is also tractable. Of course, min max problems are harder than minimization of uh, or maximization of some of some expectation, but there are still many times they are still tractable. Okay, so I'm I'm going to stick to the to the expected return. But obviously, like like every choice of the loss that we had so far, the, there is a legitimate question whether this is the right loss for a specific problem or not, and the choice of the loss is problem specific. Okay. But this is, but at least let's agree that this is a meaningful loss that can be useful, or actually it has shown to be useful in many, many problems. Okay? There are many assumptions that we are making that might not fit a certain scenario, like, for example, the full observability of the, of the environment. Now, ideally, ideally, we would like to, to do some averaging over the different states here as well. Right, but we cannot do it because we don't have access to p. We n need yet to discover p. Right? We don't. We, we don't know the rules of the game. We don't know the dynamics of this of this process. We don't know the transition probability. But if we, for example, so if we do average over experiences, experiences result from basically they are drawn from this p. Right? So basically, this transition from s to s t plus one under the action AT. They, basically, it embodies uh, P, right? So it's a realization from P. So if we do average over multiple experiences, we essentially, we discover P. This P will, will appear in, 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 uh, in this expression. So we don't do a explicit averaging over P, but it will, basically, P will, will arise here by, by the fact that we are doing uh, this sum over, over uh, different experiences. Okay, so let's do, let's translate what we have seen so far. We have the loss function, right? We have a model with, with parameters that we would like to optimize. Let's build some kind of a learning schedule, an optimization algorithm. It, it will be naive in, in some sense. So let's say we initialize to some random weights, unless you have a better initialization. Then I'm going to, to do a loop over different um, different episodes, different realizations of the game. So I start, so for every episode, I start with some initial state as zero, doesn't need to be the same state. In chess, for example, it would be always the same state because the game starts from the very same position of the, of the pieces. And then I run, I'm writing some number t here. It will be usually until the terminal state or until some fixed number of uh, time steps. So basically the outer loop here runs over episodes, the inner loop here runs over experiences. Okay, and experience is just a single transition, a single basically advancement of the, of the time parameter. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to probe my current guess of the action value function, Q, theta, with the current parameters theta. I'm going to put inside my current state, which is st, right? I'm currently at experience t, I'm putting inside my state s, and I'm going to maximize it over a. So remember, basically this model q gives me a vector, I will take the maximum of this vector, this will give me, the arg maximum will give me my best action under my current model of the, of the uh, value function, let's call it at, and I'm going to play this move. So I'm assuming that I have some emulation of the environment. So when I press a button corresponding to action AT, uh, the monster will eat the Pac-Man or the Pac-Man will evade. So something will happen. So I, I need some, some, something uh, behind the scenes that will emulate the environment. And this is one of the biggest problems in training uh, uh, real agents for real life scenarios. For example, if I'm if I'm controlling an autonomous vehicle or uh, or or an auto autonomous aircraft, of course I can simulate the road and the and the other vehicles, but that will not be exactly like in real life. If I want to play against real life, how many vehicles do I need to crash until I know how to how I, how I drive, right? So this is a, uh, this is very problematic. But but still, there are many things that can be done in emulation. At least I can I can play games that can be emulated easily, like like chess, for example, or Go. 
So I'm assuming that there is some logic behind the scenes that given my action A will respond. It will, it will respond by transitioning to a new state and by giving me the reward. So one of the very successful uses of the combination of reinforcement learning with deep learning, and basically deep learning goes here. We use a deep learning, a deep neural network for the construction of this uh, model of the of the uh, action value function. One of the one of the great successes, which really uh, just think it's quite incredible. We are we are getting used to it, but it, it was quite quite shocking, I think. So you play an Atari game, that old, uh, I don't know, decades old game, like for example. Uh, tennis or the spacecraft shooter. So the only input you receive is the array of pixels that is shown on the screen and the score. Okay, so you, you can get the score by doing OCR, optical character recognition of the score that is, is shown on the display because it always goes in the same location. This is the only thing that you, you that you you have. You have no idea that you have a tennis racket that you control. You have no idea that there is a ball that needs to be to be somehow governed and destroy all the bricks uh, on the screen. But basically, you receive the reward. And by playing many, 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 many instances of this game, many episodes, many experiences, you actually learn how to, uh, how to play it well, really incredibly well, much better than humans. Not only because of the speed of the reaction. It actually has been shown that even if you slow down this game to the speed of human reactions, the computer plays better. So it learns better how to, how to play. Uh, and basically, the map from the raw pixels to the optimal policy can be embodied by a deep neural network. This is, in my opinion, this is quite incredible because the input space is huge. The, the number of states, so basically different, different values of these pixels are different states of the game. This is what you observe from the game. And still you can play it, play it uh, better than humans. It's, it's quite incredible. So basically, you emulate this action, you receive your reward, let's say the score in your Atari game, and this is the new state, the new, the new values of the pixels on the screen, let's say. And then you do, of course, so you have one experience, you perform stochastic gradient descent on this experience. And you just crunch these games again and again until you learn a better policy. Will this work? Well, there, there are a few problems. So that's why I'm calling this a naive learning schedule. So first of all, we have correlated samples. So basically, they all result from a certain sequence of actions. So for example, if I, if I decided that my Pac-Man should go to the left, and then it goes again to the left, and then again to the left, so I have basically some sequence of related actions and related rewards, related state transitions. So because we have these correlations, the learning is very inefficient. Ideally, in all our previous settings, we assumed that our training set was sampled IID from some underlying distribution. This is definitely not IID sampling. And basically, not IID sampling, not only does it uh, decrease the efficiency of the learning, it also introduces biases that might be completely destructive. For example, if I somehow decided that my Pac-Man should always go to the left, it will be very difficult for me to get out and to get unstuck from that situation. So that there is something that also happens if I go to the right or up or down. Uh, basically, I'm, I might be still basically uh, creating uh, creating these unhealthy feedbacks in the learning, and and uh, it might not converge to uh, to anything meaningful. So let's re revise this uh, schedule. So essentially, I I want to break the dependence between the game I'm playing now and the experiences on which I'm doing gradient steps. Okay, so this is one of the things that I would do, and this is a very commonly used scenario. It is called experience replay. So I'm going to keep a cache, a table, a collection of experiences. I will call it C. This is the green, the green color. So I'm going to do the same thing as I did before. I'm going to emulate. Basically, I'm going to select my action, like here, like before. I'm going to play this action. As the result, I'm going to get this experience, right? So the experience is how the environment responded to my action, meaning it gave me a reward and it gave me a new state. And then I'm going to push that experience that I have just played into my experience cache. And then to do the learning, I don't want to 
to do gradient step on the experience that I have just played because it has these these correlated and biased uh, uh, biased effects. I would like to sample at random with uniform distribution over the experiences I have in the cache. I would like to experience a, to to sample an experience, not necessarily something that I have just played. And on that experience, I'm going to do I'm going to do the gradient step. So the the replay cache always receives new experiences, but I'm doing gradient steps on something that is not necessarily related to my current game. Okay? So this will remove... So this is equivalent to IAD sampling, right? And, and, and this, uh, this will remove uh, the dependencies that I have be before. But still, for example, if my Pac-Man always goes to the left, how, how will I discover that I can do something if I go to the right? So, for example, if I decided that le going left is a very good strategy, very good policy, why, why on earth should I try something different? And we humans, by the way, do the, do the same. We, if we are very comfortable with some situation, we might not do something that might increase our return in the future, right? Uh, so basically, this is the trade-off between what is called exploration and exploitation. So what I just described is called exploitation. We have a good uh, uh, value function and we'd like to exploit it. But maybe there is something something better. And by something better, what we'll do, I will toss a coin, an unfair coin, that will, with probability epsilon, usually a very small number, if the, if the coin falls with this probability uh, epsilon on, on its head, I'm going to just take a uniformly random action from this space of my actions. So from time to time, I will just drive my Pac-Man to, to an arbitrary direction. And I will see. Usually it will be something disastrous, but maybe sometimes it will not. And from this I will learn. So this is called exploration. So I'm exploring the state of my possibilities, even though they, are, they typically will not be optimal. And of course, most of the time I'm, I'm exploiting the value that I have learned so far. Okay? So this combined with the, with the replay cache gives, uh, gives very, a very good performance. Okay? Much better than what we have seen in the naive setting. Yes? Okay. Okay. So, so basically, the, the comment was that uh, even in this setting of experience replay and exploration and exploitation, I will still not see experiences, or I will not not learn from experiences that I have never seen. Okay. But this is true for any learning. If I haven't seen anything, I cannot learn from it. Right. So, so essentially. There might be the the space of all possible trajectories that I can take in this game might be huge. So I will really in, co in constructing this model Q Q theta, I will really rely on a maybe in terms of volume in that in that space on a tiny number of trajectories that I can uh, that I, that I will take. But this is the only way I can learn anything, right? Because otherwise I will need with I don't know, with the state space of, for example, of games like chess, how many training samples do I need to cover that entire volume? So I will really limit myself to those states that, that happen frequently. And it might, might happen that this policy that I derive from my, my uh, approximation of the, of the value function in some very rare and uncommon state will give me a disastrous result. That, that can happen. But I can actually improve the performance of my system online all the time by playing more and more. Okay, for example, Alpha Zero started by playing at random, and then after so one of the main challenges in training this is making this efficient, distributing it between many many processors and and crunching lots of lots of games in a reasonable amount of time. So DeepMind did really uh, a spectacular work. Uh, in this regard, and they were able after a few, even after a few hours, from random player to get a very powerful player by just doing this. Well, with a small, small twist and a few additional uh, important but less significant twists. Okay. Okay. So let's switch to another setting that is more popular today than than what we did before. So what we did before is called a value-based learning or Q-learning in some, in some literature because we are learning the, the Q function. Uh, so basically, our approach was to approximate 
the value function, the action value function. Okay, and from the action value fu function, of course, we can derive the optimal policy by simply maximizing over A, maximizing this function over A. Okay, now this function Q star might be difficult to uh, might be difficult to optimize. Might be a complicated relation, and and practice shows that optimizing this function. This is also a function of A and S. The policy itself, the, this conditional probability, might be easier to might be easier than estimating Q star. Okay, so instead of Q star, I would like to optimize pi star. Okay. So essentially, I would like to build a parametric model. I will now again use the the letter theta for the parameters of uh, this model, but it will it, it is now red, and previously it was orange. Uh, so I, I would like to build a parametric model for pi star, okay? And again, here I can assign the probability for every possible action from state S. So it again, will be a vector-valued function for all possible actions. Usually the action space is smaller than the, than the state space. That's why I would like to make it a vector with respect to that, to the first parameter, to, to A. Okay, so it will be a vector-valued function, but I will, I will switch freely between this notation and, and this notation as a function of two arguments, as before. Okay, so let's see how we train policy. So I want I, I wanted to directly estimate the policy. How do we train it? So the nature loss function here. So if we're talking about loss functions, this is something that we that we uh, that we minimize. So we'd like to maximize the expected return. So let's minimize the negative expected return, just to just to st stay consistent with the no notion of loss and minimization of loss with respect to theta. So my my training objective is minimizing the negative return expectation over all possible trajectories conditioned on on my policy pi theta. Okay. So this is my my training objective. Again, I can write this expected return directly like this, right? This is the discounted uh, cumulative uh, reward. We call it a return. Okay? And the expectation is taken over trajectories of this form. So basically, it's the sequence of our experiences in an episode of a game over all possible episodes. Okay? Now, let's write... So the expectation is essentially taken with respect to the probability of each trajectory, right? So it will be just a, a big sum over tau. For every tau, I have this probability, right? It's conditioned on theta. So it's conditioned on pi theta, but pi, pi theta is a function of theta. So basically, I, I'm giving you theta, and you tell me the probability of every tra trajectory happening, okay? So this is the probability. And by using Markov property, I will write this as the product of the probability of the initial state as zero, and then I will just run through the through the through the MDP through the decision process. I start at at uh, state as zero. This is the probability of taking action. So let's write it explicitly. So I start at, with probability of the initial state. There is some initial distribution of the initial states. Then the policy tells me the probability of a0 given as 0, right? Then the system, the environment will transition to the state S1 according to this transition probability, right? And then again, I will do an action. I will select from the policy action A1 given the state S1 and I will transition to state S2 according to this transition probability, and so on. This is exactly what this product tells me, right? This is how I run through the Markov chain. Okay? So let's just write my expectation as this integral over all trajectories. And this is, this is my probability over all trajectories. Right? Let's take the gradient of this expression. Well, obviously, this summation is just a linear operation. The, the gradient is also a linear operation. 
I will put the, push the gradient inside. The only thing that depends on theta is obviously this probability p. g doesn't depend on theta. Okay, now this looks like something intractable, right? So I had this, that huge, very long product of probabilities. Now I need to take the gradient of this. How the heck can you do this? Well, the probability is not discounted. What is discounted is the reward, so I can... Well, so the suggestion here is just to limit the horizon and then the product will end after a certain number of steps, but if you really want to play well, let's say a typical chess game will take a few tens of moves, right? So really writing this product for tens of moves is, is very ugly. Okay, so what I will do here is the following trick. I will multiply everything by p and divide everything by p. So it's an apparently innocuous um, operation. Of course, I'm sloppy here. I might divide by zero, but let's assume that I never divide by zero. Okay? Now, what can you tell me about this thing? How does it look like? No, this is just elementary calculus. So if you have gradient of f or derivative of f over f. This looks like the derivative of log f, right? So let's write it like derivative of log f. I have, so I always carry this negative sign because we just want to minimize a loss function and not maximize the expected return. I have the expected return of, or I, I have the return of the trajectory tau. All this integral is the expectation, right? I have the gradient of this log p times p d tau, okay? So this integral p d tau, what is it in terms of, in probabilistic terms? It's an expectation, right? So this is the expectation over tau, okay? So I have the expectation of negative return times the gradient of log p, okay? So this is already a tractable expression, okay? Let's write it explicitly. So I have this log p. I have this log p. Let's write it explicitly, or the gradient of this log p. So log p is the log of this product. How convenient. Log transforms products into sums, right? Now, we have three expressions here, right? And only one expression depends on theta. Only this second term. Of course, I have a very long sum here, but this is the only thing that depends on theta. So let's substitute it back. This is my gradient of the of the log of log p. This is just the sum of the gradients of log of the policy. Okay. So this is this is the uh, this is the loss I need to deal with the gradient of the loss, right? So I can write it explicitly by substituting the expression for the gradient of log p, okay? And when I do stochastic gradient, I will just draw one trajectory from here, or actually one experience even, not even a full trajectory, and I will, will do this stochastic approximation of the gradient, right? I will do a step in, in that direction. Okay, any questions? Well, uh, uh, what happens if I have a very long game? Uh, so the, if, if, in a very, if in my very long game I can still receive rewards very frequently, it's not a problem. If my reward is very distant in the future, so essentially uh, I will know whether I played well or not after I crashed my car or after I, uh, after I reached my destination and this will happen after, after a few hours, then that's a problem. That's the problem. It will be very different to pro difficult to propagate that reward backwards in time. But if I have instantaneous rewards all the time, then then it's basically these gradients propagate well. Okay. So essentially, what I what what this formula tells us. So when I do a gradient step here, I would like to increase the probability of all actions that. I incurred 
along a high return trajectory, right? So some trajectory might be of high return. I would like to to push its probably the probability of its actions of those experiences that I uh, that I encountered, and of course I would like to decrease the probability of uh, all actions that I incurred uh, along uh, low return trajectories, right? Now it is a little bit so I'm just writing explicitly what this g means, right? It has to be, of course it, it comes with a negative sign because we are solving a minimization problem. So essentially I am waiting my uh, this basically gradient of log pi I'm weighting it by by this term which depends on all the future rewards I'm going to receive of course discounted by the factor gamma this sounds like a little bit dramatic right so I really care so much about the future or I really care care about what I'm going to to do uh, from time t equals zero, maybe I only care about what happens from my actual time t into the future. So I really want to know whether I crashed my car in the future or not, but well, I played somehow till this point, let's not take this into account, let's take into account only, only the future return. So I will start my sum here from t and not from zero. Okay? So this is, of course, this is uh, this is a, a possibility, so I can I can modify my uh, basically my stochastic gradient step in this way. But still, the absolute value of this of this uh, expected return is not really meaningful. I really don't care about whether I got one million dollars in return or just one thousand dollars in return. I care about how I performed compared to what was has already expected from that state, right? So I really want to subtract a baseline that depends on, on my state ST. So for example, if I got $1 million, you say it, it, it's great, but my expected return was already 99, uh, 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 $999,000. So is it a good achievement or not? Probably not so much, right? So I would like to I would like to calibrate myself against this baseline. And a very standard way of, of deciding on, on this baseline is, for example, taking the moving average of the return in time. So I will average the return in time and will will subtract it, and then I will see, I will basically downweight or, uh, or upweight the probabilities of, um, of my trajectories according how well I performed compared to that baseline. Of course. Of course, it's it's a causal moving average. Okay, now the ideal weighting of my gradient, arguably, is how well my specific action a t improves over the expected uh, over the expected return over all possible actions. So the expected return over all possible actions is given by the state value function. Okay, and the return of a specific action is given by the action value function. And their difference is typically known as the advantage function. So what is the advantage of taking action, a specific action AT in my current state ST? Okay? So sometimes the advantage will be very positive, sometimes it will be negative, right? I, there is no way not to be negative because I, sometimes I'm better than the expectation, sometimes I'm, I'm worse. Okay? So I would like to wait using this uh, disadvantage fu uh, function. What is the problem? I don't know the advantage function. I don't know the state and the action value function. I don't know their difference. They are unknown. Right? When we did Q learning, when we did value-based learning, we actually estimated those functions. But I don't know them. Right? So what we can do, we can learn Let's throw in another neural network. Let's learn a parametric model of this advantage function. It will have a different set of parameters, maybe a completely different architecture as well. Let's call the parameters phi. Okay? So we'll learn the advantage function. The same way we did in Q-learning, in, in value learning uh, that I showed before. So now we have this advantage function that will, that will tell our agent how well it improved or deteriorated 
the the return by by selecting a certain policy. So this is called actor critic learning. So basically, I have a combination in some sense similar to the idea of guns. So I have two competing models. One of them is acting according to uh, to waiting to basically to to scoring that my uh, my advantage my estimate of the advantage function tells me, and then the advantage function. Uh, that essentially is learned using a regular value-based learning. This is just value-based learning. So instead of Q, I, I estimate A. Uh, the advantage function is called the critic, and it tells the, the actor, the agent, how well it performed. And we learn these two functions simultaneously. We optimize over the parameters phi and the parameters theta. Theta describe the policy, and phi, phi describe the... Uh, and if I describe the, the advantage function. Yes? So, so we, we, you, you'll see all these, you see all the details how exactly this learning works in the, in the tutorial. Basically, we, we, we ran out of time. But essentially, it is a combination of policy-based learning, sometimes referred as policy gradient, with value-based learning, or Q learning, but now instead of Q, we are learning the difference between Q and V. Okay, so basically, it's 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 just a combination of the two uh, of the two learning problems. We are learning them simultaneously. One of them uses the loss that I described. Another one uses the regular loss that we had in QR. Okay. Any questions? Well, so next next time we we will start talking a little bit about uh, about hardware, and then once and we'll see some also some. Uh, some exercises on, on uh, GPU-related uh, code, on CUDA in, in particular, and then we'll talk about some more advanced stuff, like, for example, how to do neural networks on graphs, how to do inference on exotic domains. And graphs, of course, are exotic domains, but they are very important in many, in many learning problems. Okay. okay.